Hello friends, Alex again, back with another story for adults, another from James Thurber, this time um, from his uh, very brief autobiography entitled My Life in Hard Times, published in 1933, uh, the story of the night the bed fell. The Night the Bed Fell by James Thurber. I suppose that the high water mark of my youth in Columbus, Ohio, was the night the bed fell on my father. It makes a better recitation, unless, as some friends of mine have said, one has heard it five or six times, than it does a piece of writing, for it is almost necessary to throw around furniture around, shake doors, and bark like a dog to lend the proper atmosphere and vilisimilitude uh, to what is admittedly a somewhat incredible tale. Still, it did take place. It happened then that my father had decided to sleep in the attic one night, to be away where he could think. My mother opposed the notion strongly because, she said, the old wooden bed up there was unsafe. It was wobbly and the heavy headboard would crash down on father's head in case the bed fell and kill him. There was no dissuading him, however, and at a quarter past ten he closed the attic door behind him and went up to the, the narrow, twisting stairs. We later heard ominous creakings as he crawled into bed. Grandfather, who usually slept in the attic bed when he was with us, had disappeared some days before. On these occasions, he was usually gone six or eight days and returned growling and out of temper with the news that the Federal Union was run by a passel of blockheads and that the Army of the Potomac didn't have any more chance than a fiddler's bitch. We were visiting, we had visiting us at this time a nervous first cousin of mine named Briggs Beale, who believed that he was likely to cease breathing when he was asleep. It was his feeling that if he were not awakened every hour during the night, he might die of suffocation. He had been accustomed to setting an alarm clock to ring at intervals until morning, but I persuaded him to abandon this. He slept in my room, and I told him that I was such a light sleeper that if anybody quit breathing in the same room with me, I would wake instantly. He tested me the first night, which I had suspected he would, by holding his breath after he, after my regular breathing had convinced him I was asleep. I was not asleep, however, and called to him. This seemed to allay his fears a little, but he took the precaution of putting a glass of spirits of camphor on a little table at the head of his bed. In case I didn't arouse him until he was almost gone, he said, he would sniff the camphor, a powerful reviver. Briggs was not the only member of his family who had the crutchets. Old Aunt Melissa Beale, who would, could whistle like a man with two fingers in her mouth, suffered under the premonition that she was destined to die on South High Street because she had been born on South High Street and married on South High Street. Then there was Aunt Sarah Schof, who never went to bed at night without the fear that a burglar was going to get in and blow chloroform under her door through a tube. To avert this calamity, for she was in greater dread of anesthetics than of losing her household goods, she always piled her money, silverware, and other valuables in a neat stack just outside her bedroom with a note reading, This is all I have. Please take it and do not use your chloroform, as this is all I have. Aunt Gracie Schof also had a burglar phobia, but she met it with, with more fortitude. She was confident the burglars had been getting into her house every night for 40 years. The fact that she never missed anything was to her no proof to the contrary. She always claimed that she scared them off before they could take anything by throwing shoes down the hallway. When she went to bed, she piled where she could get at them handily all the shoes that there were about her. Five minutes after she had turned off the light, she would sit up in bed and say, Hark! Her husband, who had learned to ignore the whole situation as long ago as 1903, would either be sound asleep or pretend to be sound asleep. In either case, he would not respond to her tugging and pulling, so that presently she would rise, tiptoe to the door, open it slightly and heave a shoe down the hall in one direction and its mate down the hall in the other direction. Some nights she threw them all, some nights only a couple of pair. And here's, a, here's an illustration of some nights she threw them all.
but I am straying from the remarkable incidents that took place during the night that the bed fell on Father. By midnight, we were all in bed. The layout of the rooms and the disposition of their occupants is important to an understanding of what later occurred. In the front room upstairs, just under Father's attic bedroom, were my mother and my brother Herman, who sometimes sang in his sleep, usually marching through Georgia or onward Christian soldiers. Briggs Beale and myself were in a room adjoining this one. My brother Roy was in a room across the hall from ours. Our bull terrier, Rex, slept in the hall. My bed was an army cot, one of those affairs which are made wide enough to sleep on comfortably only by pulling up flat with the middle section, the two sides which ordinarily hang down like the sideboards of a drop leaf table. When these sides are up, it is perilous to roll too far toward the edge, for then the cot is likely to tip completely over, bringing the whole bed down on top of one with a tremendous crashing bang. This, in fact, is precisely what happened about two o'clock in the morning. It was my mother who, in recalling the scene later, first referred to it as, quote, the night the bed fell on your father, end quote. Always a deep sleeper, slow to arouse, I had lied to Briggs. I was at first unconscious of what had happened, when the iron cot rolled me onto the floor and toppled over on me. It left me still warmly bundled up and unhurt, for the bed rested above me like a canopy. Hence I did not wake up, only reached the edge of consciousness and went back. The racket, however, instantly awakened my mother in the next room, who came to the immediate conclusion that her worst dread was realized. The big wooden bed upstairs had fallen on father. She therefore screamed, "'Let's go to your poor father!' It was this shout, rather than the noise of my cot falling, that awakened Herman, in the same room with her. He thought that Mother had become, for no apparent reason, hysterical. "'You're all right, Mama,' he shouted, trying to calm her. They exchanged shouts for shout for perhaps ten seconds. "'Let's go to your poor father, and you're all right!' That woke up Briggs. By this time, I was conscious of what was going on in a vague way, but did not yet realize that I was under my bed instead of on it. Briggs, awakened in the midst of loud shouts of fear and apprehension, came to the quick conclusion that he was suffocating and that we were all trying to bring him out. And here's a picture of Briggs. He came to the conclusion that he was suffocating. With a low moan, he grasped the glass of camphor at the head of his bed and, instead of sniffing it, poured it over himself. The room reeked of, camp reeked of camphor. Ugh! Ugh! croaked Briggs, like a drowning man, for he had almost succeeded in stopping his breath under the deluge of pungent spirits. He leaped out of bed and groped towards the open window, but he came up against one that was closed. With his hand, he beat out the glass, and I could hear it crash and tinkle on the alleyway below. It was at this juncture that I, in trying to get up, had the uncanny sensation of feeling my bed above me. Foggy with sleep, I now suspected, in my turn, that the whole uproar was being made in a frantic endeavor to extricate me from what must be an unheard of and perilous situation. Get me out of this, I bawled. Get me out. I think I had the nightmarish belief that I was entombed in a mine. Gawk, gasped Briggs, floundering in his camphor. By this time, my mother, still shouting, persuaded, pursued by Herman, still shouting, was trying to open the door to the attic in order to go up and get my father's body out of the wreckage. The door was stuck, however, and wouldn't yield. Her frantic pulls on it only added to the general banging and confusion. Roy and the dog were now up, the one shouting questions, the other barking. Father, furthest away and sound sleeper of all, had by this time been awakened by the battering on the attic door. He decided the ha that the house was on fire. I'm coming, I'm coming, he wailed in a slow, sleepy voice. I'm coming, I'm coming. It took him many minutes to regain full consciousness. My mother, still believing he was caught under the bed, detected in his I'm coming the mournful, resigned note of one who is preparing to beat his maker. 
He's dying, she shouted. I'm all right, Briggs yelled to reassure her. I'm all right. He still believed that it was his own closeness to death that was worrying Mother. I found at last the light switch in my room, unlocked the door, and Briggs and I joined the others at the attic door. The dog, who never liked, who never did like Briggs, jumped for him, assuming that he was the culprit in whatever was going on, and Roy had to throw Rex and hold him. And here's a picture of Roy throwing Rex. There we go. <laughs> um, we could hear Father crawling out of bed upstairs. Roy pulled the attic door open with a mighty jerk, and Father came down the stairs sleepy and irritable, but safe and sound. My mother began to weep when she saw him. Rex began to howl. What in the name of God is going on here? asked my father. The situation was finally put together like a giant, gigantic jigsaw puzzle. Father caught a cold from prowling around in his bare feet, but there were no other bad habit results. I'm glad, said Mother, who always looked on the bright side of things, that your grandfather wasn't here. That was The Night the Bed Fell on... The Night the Bed Fell by James Thurber. We'll do another one soon. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.